Hello, welcome to Frederick Church's Olana. I'm Sean Sawyer, president of the Olana Partnership. We're the private educational nonprofit that operates Olana in cooperation with the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. We're so glad that you're choosing to join this virtual tour today. Uh, I'm standing here at the final culminating point of the approach to the main house at Olana, seen behind me. Um, what you saw in the opening pan and is spread out before me is what Olana is all about. The views, the landscape, to be in the landscape here atop this hill overlooking the Hudson Valley and the Catskill Mountains. This was Frederick Church's dream that he was able to realize, a little bit of Eden in the American wilderness. Uh, we're very happy to have you uh, with us virtually. I hope you will come and visit us this summer or this autumn. Uh, we're so happy to be reopened. Um, and you'll see the amazing exhibition we have inside. But I particularly want to emphasize the power of coming to Olana, the power of place in being in the landscape. It's 250 acres designed by Frederick Church at the same time that he was involved in the creation of Central Park and of the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. So it really is a masterwork of the American landscape and of the American cultural moment of the mid 19th century. Thank you. Now you're going to start your tour with Will Coleman, our Director of Collections and, Re and Exhibitions. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us at Olana today. You've got a beautiful day for it here in the Hudson Valley. The Catskills are in stark relief against the horizon beyond us. Um, and you have this rather incredible building here behind me that we're going to go explore in search of decorative arts goodness. I'm a great admirer of the Decorative Arts Trust. I've been enjoying your virtual programs and I'm glad to be able to share a place I really love with you all. So what you see from the outside here is a riot of color and form, uh, an eccentric roof line with little minarets and tours and uh, porches jutting out here and there, a number of outdoor rooms that are a core part of the function of this building. Spaces engaged with this wonderful landscape designed by Frederick Church, but not separated from it, that we know were used as uh, additional living rooms of the house. You'll see stars of David and Arabic lettering and all manner of global reference to decorative traditions near and far. There's a lot to see and a lot to take in, and we look forward to sharing all of it with you. Um, so without further ado, please join me and we'll go through the front door. I promised Arabic lettering. You will see behind our, our lamp atop the door the word mahaba, welcome in Arabic. And you are most welcome to the main house at Olana. You're now in the East Parlor in the main house at Olana, which is the first room you would have arrived in as a visitor in the time of Frederick Edwin Church, who made these complex interior environments. Um, as you see, there's a lot we could talk about here today, but I'm going to choose just some highlights for our uh, decorative arts audience. And uh, among many other paintings that are my specialty, the collections within the collection include a great one of Indian furniture, and that might be one case study to start with. Um, these painted Indian chairs from Kashmir, uh, which came to church in Olana via the interlocutor uh, Lockwood de Forest, who's a really important shaping influence on this family home. I'll be saying that name a lot, so bear with me. We know that de Forest was kind of studying painting with Frederick Church, was um, spending a fair bit of time here as a distant relative of the family, and he built this interesting pipeline uh, between skilled Indian craftspeople, mostly working in Ahmedabad, and American buyers, uh, one of whom was Frederick Edwin Church. We know that American buyers could place very specific orders through the Lockwood de Forest workshop in Manhattan um, to get specific furniture to fit the dimensions of their fireplace, their room, whatever it may be. Um, so that's one of the things that contributes to making this eclectic global interior environment feel the way it does. The way I think about this place is that it was uh, in a part a branding exercise by Frederick Edwin Church, who was competing in a challenging market economy for landscape painting in the middle of the 19th century. 
and this place was making a very clear argument that he was the global artist of his time, that he was bringing back useful knowledge about far-flung places to the buyers of his artworks. He was tremendously successful at drumming up popular attention for his artworks, making these exhibitions sometimes of a single picture that were popular events. And coming to this incredibly well-preserved artist's home, we get a sense of the work that went into making those charismatic pictures. In these rooms like the East Parlor, you'll see a lot of smaller preparatory works for his large finished paintings. Um, you'll also see these things brought back from those travels to the places he made his own, like uh, South America with works like the Heart of the Andes, like the Arctic with his images of icebergs, like the great picture in the Dallas Museum of Art, and all over the Middle East, uh, thus the making of a house that he considered Persian. Um, it is that and it is nothing. It is a complex composite, a kind of American eclecticism in the latter part of the 19th century that brings together many different spheres of reference, many different styles. Um, and uh, untangling these spheres of reference is uh, the journey of a lifetime and we'll share a little bit of that work with you today. More of Lockwood DeForest here in the fireplace surround. We know that you, the buyer could go to that New York workshop, choose precisely that pattern in carved Burmese teak, and then get it made by these mystery, these masters working in Ahmedabad precisely to your needed dimensions. Um, we have above the fireplace here one of the works of our special exhibition right now. You'll be seeing some surprising interventions at Olana as you walk through. Uh, reminders that this was always a site of contemporary creativity with new and sometimes challenging ideas being unfolded on canvas and in the natural world in Olana's materials. Here we have a really useful work to start our exhibition, the Brazilian artist Vic Muniz deconstructing and remaking a painting by the 19th century American artist Martin Johnson Heed, who shared a studio at the 10th Street Studio building with Frederick Church. Um, and came to be known for this hybrid of landscape painting and flower painting, still life and, and these macrocosmic visions of the natural world, very different than Frederick Church had practiced. And that's something we're, we're thinking about this year. Uh, Muniz takes back this Brazilian subject from an American interloper or dabbler and deconstructs some of the myths of the jungle with all these humorous references, some little happy hikers in the foreground, golden masks maybe evoking the lost city of El Dorado and even dinosaurs um, playing with our notions of the exotic jungle. Next we'll go through to the sitting room. As you move farther into the uh, spaces of Olana, you get more and more into intimate family environments, and the sitting room is one of these. I often think about this house in terms of the, the enfilade you often hear about in uh, French architectural history, like the enfilade of Versailles. You get progressively more intimate as you move farther into the house, culminating at the studio, the creative space at the heart of it all. Here we're in a room primarily associated with Isabel Carnes Church, who is another key shaping influence whose name needs to be spoken right at the start of our tour. Uh, Frederick Church's wife was a, a key design influence here who had a big major role in choosing the colors of Olana. Uh, and we believe she also had an important role in bringing in the significant collection of Asian art, um, furniture, painting, ceramics, much more, uh, because her family were missionaries in China. We know in this room that Lockwood and Forest made a desk custom to her dimensions, this diminutive little desk here, more of that carved Burmese teak. Um, she stood, we understand, four foot eleven, so uh, a nice comfortable desk for her. There are some things missing from this room that we hope someday to return. We know that there was a great portrait of Alexander von Humboldt hanging roughly in this corner, a sign of Church's devotion to that scientist. As you come around, you'll see a portrait of Isabel herself hanging on the wall sense of this other design influence in the house. Um, and you'll see the uh, pseudo-Arabic script of our window surrounds here. Um, there is certainly a through line of Orientalism at Olana, and that is something that we try to tackle head on in all the work we do here in the 21st century of a place that is eager for critical inquiry, eager to raise up the stories that have not been so well told, um, and to face head on the issues of cultural appropriation that caused the house to look the way it does. It's undeniably true that there's real affection underlying Church's engagement with the places he traveled to, um, particularly uh, modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and uh, modern-day Israel and Palestine. 
Um, but there's also this problem that he is invoking the romance of these foreign lands without really engaging with the lived experience of the people of those lands. So that pseudo-Arabic script to evoke a mood is one product of that. Um, we do also have a real translatable script here above the fireplace that I'm told reads, uh, while the fire burns, I muse, a quote from one of the Psalms. It's hard to go through these rooms not focusing on the paintings, which I admit are my bread and butter. We have to talk about the painting above the fireplace, the elephant-sized elephant in this room, uh, Petra, El Cosne Petra by Church. Often what you see in the main house is smaller preparatory studies. We don't have so many of those large finished exhibition works. This is one of the largest of all in a frame designed by Frederick Church. There we go, I found a deck arts hook. Uh, a frame designed with a Middle Eastern motif to set the mood for the discovery of that building that was believed to be the treasury at the heart of Petra. Uh, we have this large finished exhibition work because it was a gift to Isabel in Isabel's room at the Art of Ola. Uh, there are a couple of other little sad stories here as we go back toward the court hall. I'll leave you with these two, Sunrise and Moonrise, which were made as celebratory pictures um, for the birth of the first two church family children who sadly died uh, one after the other in the 1860s from another pandemic, uh, diphtheria, which was a very sad loss of the family that sent them on another global journey of recovery. Now we're entering the court hall, this grand central space of the main house a kind of a crossroads where you have the, the long enfilade to the studio and then also this crosswise axis toward this grand stenciled window above the main stairs. Um, lots that we could talk about in here. Uh, I'll point out uh, numerous ceramics. I'll point out also um, this really interesting hybrid object, which we understand is a, uh, a little niche of the Jain faith tradition, but with a Mexican Madonna placed inside it. This kind of syncretic curiosity, fascination with global faith traditions that coexisted with the church family's own uh, fairly mainstream Protestant spirituality. Uh, no contradiction for them, of including references to Islam, Judaism, uh, and Jainism. More we can point out here includes uh, an interesting little discovery recently uh, for the American deck arts nerds. Uh, we have this lovely piece from a uh, George Washington personal service of Society of the Cincinnati Porcelain. We are told by those who know best from Mount Vernon that this did pertain to Washington himself, not just any Society of the Cincinnati officer. So glad to have that through line from your talk with the wonderful Alexander Kirtley. Uh, we can also point out some metalwork in the collection. Um, this is a 19th century uh, Middle Eastern, unfortunately that's as specific as we can get, um, lamp holder, candle or lamp holder. And you can see its, its weight has caused it to crack a little bit. It has a whole elaborate um, apparatus on the inside keeping it intact, worked on by our New York State Parks conservators. Um, it's resting in good Frederick Church fashion in global melding atop a Chinese stand here. And there's, as I alluded, a significant amount of Asian art, Asian furniture in the collection. Next, we'll come through to the dining room. The dining room is unlike any other space at Olana. Maybe you'll hear my voice echoing a little differently in here. You'll see the Claire Story windows looking out to the treetops, but not eye-level windows keeping you engaged with that all-important design landscape out of doors. The one room of the house where that's the case, and you'll see the reason why, that this was also described by Frederick Church as the picture gallery. And I think that's really interesting, that he was already, long before um, the partnered preservation of Olana as Olana State Historic Site and opening to the public as a museum, he was thinking of it as a museum. This is a collection of paintings not by church. He's claiming descent from all these masters of Europe, um, showing his place in the lineage of landscape painting, um, and creating a really grand uh, baronial hall um, to gather with his family. Right now, we have the table arranged at its smallest setting. This can greatly expand, and we know that there were um, grand dinners for the likes of uh, Mark Twain, um, the, the writer, uh, expeditionary and traveler, William Edwards, the Tantalars, Mary and North, all kinds of interesting global travelers were coming through Olana. You'll see one of the two pianos of Olana in this room, uh, and there's a whole interesting story yet to be fully told of the musical culture of this place. There's a whole sense experience that we need to do a better job of bringing back 
And indeed, one of our pandemic projects was something that you can now look up on Spotify, a playlist called Music of the Obama Collection, where we went through the thousands of pages of sheet music that were used on these pianos uh, to play what turned out to be largely transcriptions for solo piano of popular opera scores. That was the bread and butter of the musical life of Bologna. Uh, so if you're into that sort of thing, go have a look on Spotify. Ceramics, our whole tour in their own right, I'll just call out a couple works of ceramic in this room. Um, as you make out from the modern case here, this is one of the things connected to our current exhibition in collaboration with the Thomas Cole National Historic Site. Uh, we're talking about artists who are engaged with the fragile rhythms of the natural world, studying intimate, smaller details of nature, like in this case, flowers. And this is the work of Emily Cole, Thomas Cole's daughter, the daughter of Frederick Church's teacher, who had a direct relationship with Frederick Church herself after Thomas Cole's early demise. Um, and those letters that survive in our archive tell a story of uh, Frederick Church guiding Emily in access to the art world, gaining access to training and exhibition. And we see the result here in this really beautiful magnolia plate at left, a uh, very sensitive practice of botanical art. Um, and one of the topics of this show is facing head on this thorny issue of why was this practice mere ladies flower painting when it was practiced by Emily Cole? And why was it a lofty high art worthy of veneration um, by Martin Johnson Heat when it was practiced by a male artist in this period? Um, so we're trying to untangle that. We're thinking about how um, natural historic curiosity was a through line for these artists, how they were collecting the original specimens, bird eggs, butterflies, taxidermy birds, and using them in making their, their paintings and their art. Another work of ceramic art we can point to in here, a personal favorite, um, is just one precious piece of Maiolica, uh, tin glazed earthenware from Italy. Um, we have not had a chance to do much work on this thing yet, but uh, a past life as a, a deck arts researcher at the, the LACMA, uh, working under uh, Tom Mickey, came, let me come to love this stuff, um, seeing how it was aspiring to the condition of porcelain. We have a useful glitch in the matrix here where you see the fragile earthenware that can't compare to the, the durability of Emily Cole's uh, hand-painted porcelain there. Um, but a lovely pictorial medium that spoke to the painter Frederick Church and his travels brought back home. We will now go upstairs. I want to show you this grand space, uh, the landing of the main stairs that feels a little bit like a stage. Um, you'll see the curtains at either side, uh, a little bit of elevation over the court hall below. And we know that this space was used as a theatrical space, that there were some um, costumed entertainments held here, a visiting opera singer supposedly sang for her supper. And then you have this rather unexpected diorama in front of you, and we have photos that document this arrangement largely as it is, as it is right now, as you see it including an early drawing by Frederick Church showing the Buddha under the stairs, one of the, the three Buddhas of Olana, uh, one more global faith tradition uh, that fascinated him. At left, we often get uh, questions about whether this is a funerary monument. Why is there a gravestone in the middle of the main house? Um, it's not a funerary monument. This is Church's close friend, the Albany sculptor Erastus Dow Palmer's sleep. So just sleeping, not dead. Uh, I'll also point out for um, people in similar institutions who might find this new technology useful to them, we're standing on top of something that is very new. Uh, these are reproduction carpets made with a very exciting new technology, this British firm IMATS, E-Y-E-M-A-T-S. These are basically high resolution photographic prints of historic carpets, specific historic carpets in the Olana collection that we can't let people trample on anymore. They were getting worn out, so they've been in storage for the past 10 years. These just went in a couple of weeks ago, and they are incredibly effective at returning this really important key space, this crossroads at the heart of Olana to its original appearance with um, a dense riot of color and line and form that um, brings that sensor experience back to the heart of this space. It's also dramatically changing the sound of this space. You used to hear a lot of creaking as I walked up these stairs, and clearly the house is a lot happier now with these rugs back in place. So highly recommended if uh, any other um, museums are thinking of carpet reproduction projects. These stairs have a, a nice gentle rise, and one hypothesis has been that that might again be a little tribute to uh, Isabel Carnes Church, who we know was a tiny lady. I want to point out one of our big exhibition interventions this year, um, not only to celebrate our current project, but to allude to a historic installation in this place. 
Um, Vic Muniz's um, towering wet Brazilian orchid after Martin Johnson he this collage of cut paper um, not only works as a tr transition point to our, our second floor gallery installations with a large amount of historic loans for this project, it also calls back to what used to be here, this void at the heart of Olana. In this place, hanging almost down to the dark wood below, would have been a great Japanese scroll painting, the third Buddha of Olana, uh, known as the Nehanzu, the depiction of the death of the historical Buddha with all the animals of nature mourning his loss. Um, these objects, as you may know, are meant to be rotated seasonally, and this one was not rotated for over 100 years, and it is now in pretty dire condition, but we aren't giving up. Uh, working with the wonderful conservators of state parks, we're trying to find new technological solutions to get this thing initially photographically recorded and digitally conserved, and then eventually the conservation of the original object. So stay tuned. Hopefully that really important piece of Alana's um, story will be back there before long. You're now getting into kind of intimate family spaces, the upstairs bedrooms. I'll point out one interesting object that would have originally been in one of these bedrooms. We refer to this as the Chinese bed. Again, you're seeing a lot of Asian art, even though the church family never traveled to Asia. Um, there is this connection through Isabel Karn's uh, church's family, who were missionaries there. Um, we had a, a study day about Chinese furniture in the collection recently, and we learned that this inlay technique you see around um, the top of this bed is a particular um, threatened craft tradition associated with the city of Ningbo. Um, and it's now called an intangible cultural heritage of the Chinese nation. So we've been working on decoding some of the stories within it. We've been told that this may be one of the only examples of this practice in this country. Um, and because Alana used to have a very productive peach orchard, we were especially excited to learn the identity of this figure here, Luo, the god of longevity, who is holding and offering for your consumption the world peach that gives you eternal life. You're welcome to take a peek in uh, these two rooms to my left, the dressing room and uh, Isabel Church's bedroom. Get a sense of what it would have been like to wake up at Olana. The carpets you're seeing in these spaces are original. The furnishings, the ceramics, all original. This incredibly well-preserved case study. The wallpaper was recently restored um, in the 2000s, I believe it was, by a firm um, in New York. Uh, this is a Japanese technique, I believe it's called momigami. Um, and we know this would have been historically in this place. Really beautiful. You'll have to come here in person to experience its delicacy. Mrs. Church's bedroom, more of that intricate restored wallpaper. These rooms have only been open to the public for a little more than 10 years, so uh, relatively recent restoration work. There are some interesting things hiding in the corners of these rooms. You might just be able to make out an evocation of the Aurora Borealis, the northern lights there, um, an interesting image in the Arctic, uh, uh, Arctic peak named for Frederick Church um, at the top right corner of the room. All kinds of interesting things, and we're working on getting the carpets in here restored as well so that people can hopefully access these rooms and not just peek in from the outside. Next up, we've got the Ombra room, which we understand was largely a kind of a guest bedroom. And you've got the grand view out that windows at all times. You're seeing the river below, the lake that sort of rhymes with it within our own property, uh, and more of the interesting paintings in the collection here. Our exhibition intervention in the foreground is by the artist Paula Hayes, who's creating these terrariums, she calls them, although nothing is living in this one. Um, kind of little worlds that bring together all these natural historic curiosities, uh, gems and minerals, uh, calling back to the Victorian practice of specimen collecting. We're going to enter our galleries now, former bedrooms at Olana. The first thing you'll see is the painting that inspired this show, the Martin Johnson Heat painting that we believe was gifted to Frederick Church. And when they shared a studio space at the 10th Street Studio building, um, a further kind of crystallization of the descent that is underlying this very close friendship between two artists, one of them painting great sweeps of the Andes, the other focusing in on single species of flowers with only the vaguest indication of background. In this room, we've collected a number of the smaller works that relate to the large finished paintings by uh, Cole, Church, and Heed, as well as some references to natural history collecting, 
Um, but one of my favorite things in this show is this odd little picture right ahead, which is called Gremlin in the Studio Number One. Some of you who are uh, nerds for this stuff like I am may think you've seen this one before, but I bet you haven't. Um, there's a better known second version in the Wadsworth Athenaeum. This one, on the other hand, has not been seen in public for many years. Uh, so we dug it up in a private collection for loan to this show. A kind of crystallization of the, the humorous, playful relationship between Church and Heed when they are working literally side by side. Um, the heat here is maybe mocking how much he's churning out these Newburyport salt marsh pictures so much so that his studio is getting wet because they're leaking all over the floor. Um, and you have that gremlin of the title kind of mocking the painter's efforts there underneath. So a sense that these people had a sense of humor, that they were not dead earnest all the time, um, but there is also underneath their playful relationship a sense that they were pursuing very different ends in their art. The egg collection of the church children is a really fun tie-in to our project as we think about how artists come to know and understand the natural world in uh, scientific accuracy. Uh, these are the eggs that they were collecting. Um, Nero Lana in some cases, and others ordered in from far away. I love the meticulous little, in some cases, handwritten notations on these eggs as they struggle to understand the uh, vast variety of the natural world. We've included the title page of their meticulous logbook in here. Nobody knows what the DOS society stood for, but in their administrative rigor, they gave themselves this lofty name, and we'd love to know if anybody can figure out what DOS might have meant. We do have a little bit of uh, core deck arts content to point to here in the gallery. Of course, more of the Lockwood de Forest custom ordered woodwork around the edges. But this is the first of a number of pieces of Persian ceramic art that you'll see as you move through the house at Olana. Again, fascination with uh, what was then Persia, even though Church never traveled there. Um, he owned books like uh, the Monument de la Perse, books that would help him to understand uh, Persian craft traditions. Um, but these things he's able to buy through New York dealers, really. Um, the ceramics we have are from the workshop of Ali Mohammed Isfahani, who did sign his work, a, a known craft tradition maker, and I can attest from the uh, collections and exhibitions office that these are the works in the collection about which we may receive the most reference requests. Uh, they are well known in uh, modern day Iran, and we get a lot of inquiries about them. Um, as we go through to Sharp Gallery North, you're going to be seeing The Gems of Brazil by Martin Johnson Heed. Eight of the 16 surviving paintings from that series, the other eight of which are across the river at our partner, the Tom's Cole National Historic Site, during this exhibition, Cross Pollination. Uh, we've also included, as you've just seen, a, a great painting by uh, Frederick Church on one end of the room and a nice Thomas Cole on the other end. These are fascinating images in the way they refuse to fit into our boxes of landscape painting and still life flower painting and serious painting. They, they are at the edges of the 19th century American art world, um, showing a, a distinct break with what had come before in the work of Thomas Cole, as you're seeing there, um, and indeed even in the work of Frederick Church taking place in the same studio. A particular favorite here has to be this one outlier, this gorgeous blue morpho butterfly, the one butterfly in this series that is mostly paintings of hummingbirds, these so-called gem-like uh, birds that are such a difficult subject for any painter to tackle. The blue morpho is especially apt because, as I'll be sure to point out when we go back downstairs, we have a preserved blue morpho in a bell jar down in the court hall at all times. This is one of those species that spoke to artists like Church so strongly as it spoke to heat here. Um, and I, I love zooming in on it and capturing the fragile little veins in the, in the wing. It's been a real privilege to have these things on view at Olana. So we who work here get to come back and see them over and over. As we go back downstairs, um, I'll point out this cabinet where we keep a rotating selection from our historic costume collection on view. Um, textiles in general, costume in particular, is a real strength of the collection. The, the through line I'm learning in my first two years working at Olana is that this collection is 
accidentally incredibly rich in quotidian garments, um, things that did not survive in other places that were bought up at markets in their travels by the church family and then kept very well preserved in drawers or closets for many years. So we end up with a major collection of Palestinian dress, a major collection of Mexican rebozos, these kind of shawl garments that are often worn out and discarded. Um, because the church family was taking an interest in these things in the 19th century, they have been kept and preserved um, and made available to scholars today. So you go back downstairs, you'll see again that grand golden window, um, which is made from cut pieces of paper pressed between panes of glass. You might notice that one of the panes looks a little bit different than the others. That's a conservation story. All the rest are pretty opaque. This one is perfectly clear, and that we understand is how they're meant to look, and that one unfortunately had to be replaced a few years back. Um, so that gave us a chance to give us a sense that um, this was not meant to cut you off from the landscape outside. It was meant to give you um, a warm, golden mood as you looked through it, but you were still meant to be able to see the trees and carriage roads outside as you looked through this, this statement window at the heart of Olana. This is an interesting object I've been getting a lot of questions about lately. We don't know a lot about it, but we understand that it was a kind of a folk art tradition, largely a, uh, a ladies' art in the middle of the 19th century, making these stuffed needlework pieces, um, sometimes from patterns of pre-existing work. There are some similar things out there in the world, but I am uh, self-conscious speaking to the knowledgeable members of the Deck Arts Trust. If anybody knows better, please do tell me. back downstairs into the court hall again. I'll point out, as promised, the preserved blue morpho as we turn toward the library here. Just a little hint of blue pigment left in these delicate wings here. This is the piece I was referring to. We have a story about that that may be apocryphal, but it's a good story that Frederick Church, among his many other lives as a painter, was uh, making these great images of icebergs off of Labrador, uh, culminating in the monumental painting now in Dallas. We are told that he was using this preserved blue morpho as a kind of aid memoir to get the color of icebergs as light passes through them just right. So um, you can believe that or not as you see fit. Coming into the library now, um, just one of many rooms in the house where we can find books arrayed. I've just pulled one from the shelf to give you a sense of what we can find as we move through here. This one is Brazil and the Brazilians, a beautifully um, illustrated book with lots of these nice steel engravings. Um, a useful volume for our, our project this year centering on the Gems of Brazil, the, the series of paintings of the wonders of the Amazon by this artist who was very much a disciple of Frederick Church, but going in his own direction. Um, we're so fortunate to have the books that the family was reading and learning from preserved around us here. Um, one we always point to is these, this little section of red books on that shelf there. That is the little shrine of Alexander von Humboldt, to whom Frederick Church was especially devoted. Um, his book Cosmos kind of changed Frederick Church's life, and there's a missing volume on that shelf, as you may be able to tell, because it's currently on loan to a, a major exhibition that will have closed by the time this airs, but a uh, really important show on Humboldt's impact on the decorative arts in D.C. at Smithsonian American Art Museum. So Church is his kind of key interlocutor in the arts, making Olana on the model of lessons learned about the formation of the natural world from Humboldt, and also making paintings like The Heart of the Andes as an effort to carry through Humboldt's principles into practice. In front of these books, again, we've got this obvious thing I haven't been talking about until now. Our exhibition intervention here is uh, work by Flora Mace, on loan to us from the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, our partner in this exhibition. These full flowers, not as a library might make you think, pressed flat between pages of a book, but in full three-dimensional complexity, their full root systems unfurl in resin uh, pressed between panes of glass. Um, a really interesting model of botanical art, if that's what we'd call it, making uh, of nature's own materials art, allowing these things to speak for themselves um, and for their fragile beauties to be preserved. Couldn't be more perfect for the themes of our show. We're entering the corridor now, uh, another of these spaces where we're uh, deeply engaged with the landscape out of doors, these floor to ceiling windows that we understand would have been a 
pretty uh, clear exercise in conspicuous consumption in the 19th century, very costly to produce. Uh, but this is a great place to think about the ways in which this house relates to that landscape you keep getting these peaks of, and that I hope you'll come and wander here, all 250 acres of it, with uh, more than six miles of carriage roads. This was a landscape created and designed by Frederick Church. Uh, it was a hard-used hillside farm, and the trees you're seeing were largely planted by Frederick Church. This place was deforested before he got started. So this was an effort in reforestation, land protection, when this uh, environment around us was much more industrial, uh, much less bucolic uh, in the 19th century than it is now. Um, I'll point out one particular picture here that I hope you'll be able to pick up. This horizontal winter scene is on view in this space because of its relation to our work in viewshed preservation, uh, keeping this lovely view out the windows looking the way it did. That painting literally went to court and helped to prevent the construction of a major nuclear power installation smack in the middle of that view uh, a few decades back, and it established a new legal precedent that the historic cultural value uh, of a topography can outweigh and counterbalance its uh, resource value, its extractive economic value. So we're very proud of that. Uh, dark art stories in here include this Chinese table. Um, we used to display some flowers atop this piece, and I'm making sure we don't do that anymore because we've learned how significant this beautiful piece of marble on top is in that uh, Chinese furniture study day I mentioned. We're told that this is an example of uh, a substance called Dali, which is pictorial marble, marble that in its naturally occurring whorls looks a little bit like a landscape painting if you squint and you're willing to, to go with it. Maybe this looks a little bit like a river flowing in the foreground. And Maybe we see misty mountaintops and peaks. I can totally see it. Um, so these would have been highly valued for the way they seem to be nature's own art in the same way a flower could be in the work of Flora Mace in the same way as a seashell could be um, at other times and places. So uh, really beautiful work. More here of the uh, Persian ceramic tradition of Ali Muhammad Isfahani framed up on the wall like they are painting as a sign of the respect the family had for them. Um, these lovely courtly scenes, uh, we understand they sometimes featured uh, courtiers and uh, ladies of the, the harem and stuff, so sometimes uh, risque scenes, but hanging with pride right next to the portrait of Frederick Church here, get a sense of what this person looked like. Um, and as you come around, you'll see um, this grand Jeffrey Gibson, one of our uh, exhibition interventions this year. Uh, hanging in place of a historic tapestry that's usually there. So this is a place with strong textile associations. Uh, we bring in this work in this view that reminds us about the efforts to protect this land at Olana, uh, with a work named Protects the Land from this major contemporary art of Choctaw Cherokee heritage, thinking about quilts as shrouds of protection, um, as almost magical objects that can help in the task of uh, responding to the environmental concerns of the present. In that word protects, I, I hear resonance of the water protector movement in which indigenous peoples have played a really important role in uh, pipeline protests. You see some of his characteristic forms like this faceless figure with sleeves covered in the jingle beads of powwow dance. Um, so, or neatly stitched all these whorls and stitches as you move through it. A uh, really beautiful thing and one of the fascinating responses um, to these uh, interventions of our exhibition has been seeing how this complex environment makes space for these things. How that golden window to the right resonates with the bright colors of the quilt. Um, and we keep on finding that contemporary artists are um, so thrilled to have their work on view here, really excited to see these things in spaces that are not white cube galleries, but historic environments, historic creative environments at that, where they take on new meaning. A prime example of that is our last space of the main house, the studio at the heart of Olana, the core creative space. And at its heart, there's a bold sound suit by Nick Cave, covered in flowers. You see the through line here. We're talking a lot about flowers as materials for art, flowers as the subject of painting. Um, here, flowers becoming, again, a kind of shroud of protection for the wearer, the bearer of this complex object whose own identity becomes almost irrelevant underneath this unapologetically beautiful guise, um, this great headdress encrusted in flowers. Uh, there are more than 500 of these sound suits out there in the world now, as you may know. Um, we are intrigued to know that this one has a date line of 2006 to 12, that uh, Cave kept on returning to it, perfecting it, responding to it, um, and has requested it for loan multiple times, but it does not get shown very often, so we're very lucky to have it on view here. 
framed by the stenciled window uh, with the half round porch beyond at the end of the main house at Olana, the last part of the house to be completed in 1892, uh, just eight years before Frederick Church's death, resonating beautifully with some other objects in the surrounding. And I might point to the left to this painting of Sor Pudenciana, a Mexican woman about to enter a convent who's wearing a floral headdress of her own. We did not plan on that, and we get no um, credit for that, but it is a kind of lovely rhyme with the sound suit next to it. We have another story here, a fun story of Olana that you can take or leave as you see fit. You might notice there's this kind of lavender glow coming through her dress here, and we have a few different options about why that might be. A, is that Frederick Church purposely tried to antique the picture and make it look a little more evocative and ancient by buffing it up a little bit. B, that he tried to do some amateur art conservation and actually accidentally overcleaned it, so you see the underpainting. And C, some combination of A and B, and that he actually made the whole room the color of the underpaint um, in this painting. So you can see a sort of relationship there in this terracotta color around us. We may never know for sure if there's anything to these stories, but they're good stories. More of the uh, ceramic tradition of Ali Muhammad Isfahani in the fireplace here. One of these objects we get a lot of inquiries about, perfectly framed again by that carved Burmese teak from the Lakwa de Forest workshop in Ahmedabad, India. Another of the pianos of the house as you pan around. Again, we wish that we could bring back more of that musical experience in Milan. We know that there was music being played, that there was singing happening with visiting opera stars. Um, and so we're, we're working to understand as much as we can about uh, what music would have been heard here. This was a creative space, as I mentioned. So we have the original artist materials here, original easels, paint box, um, palettes and brushes, not interpretive material brought in in the 21st century, but um, the actual tools of making Frederick Church's paintings that we're very fortunate to have. Um, you also see here in another Lockwood de Forest cabinet, and I promised lots of Lockwood de Forest, um, original works of pre-Columbian art on the top register of this case that allude to the fact that church was uh, taking an interest in the indigenous art of the Americas. And um, there's one fascinating letter in which he posits the formation of a department of the art of all the Americas in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, of which he was a founding trustee, uh, and that he gave the first works of pre-Columbian art to that collection, which was a story celebrated in their uh, recent anniversary exhibition, which was uh, unfortunately shuttered by the pandemic. But these pre-Columbian uh, antiquities are evidence of that deep affection and interest uh, for that place, uh, for the peoples of Mexico in particular, where he spent a lot of time in the latter years of his life because he was suffering from uh, a nasty case of rheumatoid arthritis and was not getting a lot of painting done in the final years there. So you'll see the Mexican uh, sombreros there, his sketchbooks from the Mexico trip, um, and uh, Sor Pudenciana there, another trace of that Mexican interest. So that brings us to the end of the, the interpreted public spaces of the main house at Olana. We can exit onto the piazza, which is a lovely final space to end our tour, one of these outdoor rooms. Back engaged with that view on a beautiful day. We know that these outdoor rooms would have been furnished and used like further living rooms of the house, taking meals out here, tea and coffee. Um, and you can see across the bridge there to building up this property over multiple decades. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual tour of Olana State Historic Site. A uh, little peek at the landscape, which is a whole other story for another day, a deeper dive into the complexity of the main house. I hope you'll come and see us in person before long.